So welcome back, uh, everybody. Um, I'd like to uh, get item agenda item 13 uh, underway. And I understand that uh, we now have uh, all participants for this session uh, online. Um, Andy Coop, Perlin, uh, Leslie, and uh, the chair of the panel session, Stuart mentioned. So, Andy, uh, welcome to Southwest Pacific uh, meeting 19, um, our annual meeting. We're very pleased that uh, you can present to us here um, and, and uh, share with us your experience of um, the um, uh, integrated geospatial information framework. Um, and very keen to hear your um, hear your experience and uh, uh, of, of, of this um, framework. Well, Adam, thank you very much for inviting me and uh, um, uh, I'm uh, very feel very privileged. Uh, you're, you're obviously a very uh, dedicated group of uh, uh, of individuals from uh, uh, all that I've heard this morning and uh, hopefully I can give you just a bit of an insight into uh, what's going on in this uh, wider environment of the uh, uh, the IGIF. So uh, without further ado, let me uh, uh, press on into this. Uh, just to explain my background, I, um, uh, I have uh, done uh, a few projects which have been in the uh, hydrographic domain, but most of my experience has been uh, in the land domain over the uh, the last 40 years that I've been practicing. So um, uh, I'm very happy when it comes to the, to the hydrographic side of things. You know far more about it than I do, but hopefully I can give you some, some pointers to where things have been developed so far around IGIF. Uh, and I'm really looking forward to uh, uh, the ideas being picked up and enhanced uh, by your community. What I'd just like to start off with uh, is, is if we're looking at the uh, big picture uh, of why we're doing this and, and perhaps the, the value proposition to uh, our decision makers in, in government and uh, uh, in other bodies, um, you can't do much better than to quote Peter Drucker. Um, Peter was a famous management consultant uh, and he said, you can't manage what you don't measure. And if you think about what we do, we measure the earth uh, and we have no more important resource uh, available to us uh, than the, uh, the globe that we all share. So uh, that perhaps underpins why, why this is important. What I think makes it uh, even more pertinent is uh, the fact that we're moving into this uh, what's dubbed the information age or the uh, the fourth industrial revolution, um, and this is a this is a quote from uh, the U.S. magazine Forbes uh, that it's a period that's characterised by digital transformation from traditional industry to an economy based on data and communication, uh, and that becomes the driving force of social evolution. And if we think back to the days those of us that can remember the days before the internet, the changes that have occurred in the last 20 or so years uh, are just dramatic. But it does force to the fore the kinds of things that we do um, and the information that, that we provide. So when we talk about uh, a marine spatial data infrastructure or, or, or any kind of infrastructure, uh, the kinds of things that perhaps come into our minds, first of all, are uh, infrastructures that are physical. So we have the road transport network and, and few of us can deny that that has uh, changed the way in which society has developed over the over the last hundred or, or, or so years. Uh, in the marine environment, uh, we've got ships. Ships have got bigger, uh, they've got more powerful, and that has driven the blue economy. Uh, but these are things that most uh, members of the public would would understand because they're they're things that they can uh, see and feel. But I think what we're trying to make the point is that, uh, in fact, information 
is just as much of an infrastructure as those other two. Um, and what we find when we look worldwide is that uh, information uh, is underpinned by geospatial. Geospatial is one of the key parts of the what we might call the national information infrastructure in each of our countries. Um, and certainly when we're talking about the oceans, we're talking about uh, a global um, information infrastructure. And I think it's important to, to get our terminology right when we're, we're talking about these things. My feeling is that what you're talking about in the marine environment and, and what uh, in the land environment has been spoken about for uh, a number of years has, have developed in parallel and are very much um, based on the same kinds of concepts. So if we can share uh, not only our information, but our knowledge uh, and our experience, then we'll go a lot further. The other thing I wanted to talk about is within the, the UN GGIM, uh, we talk about some fundamental data themes, and I've put a link in there at the bottom uh, to where uh, this is um, expanded in a lot more detail. But fundamentally, all of the themes of data, uh, we're looking, uh, I think, on a global basis to uh, take the assumption that from the top of the highest mountain to the bottom of the deepest trench, and even up into the atmosphere, uh, that each of the themes of data that we talk about, we need to have the information right through that um, uh, transition from, uh, uh, from water through to land and into the, uh, uh, into the air. So when I look at that list on the right hand side there, there are only a, a couple where you could say there is less significance uh, of, the, uh, uh, of the marine environment, perhaps settlements um, and uh, perhaps uh, some of the things around land cover and land use. But all of the others, you can look at them and you can say these have very significant contributions to be made by the marine community uh, as well as uh, the, the terrestrial community. So the integrated geospatial information framework was really created on the back of what I've just been talking about. So radical changes in terms of digital transformation, but also uh, a greater abundancy of, of, of data, uh, particularly when we look at this from the point of view of uh, a national mapping or a national um, hydrographic or marine authority. There are other sources of data. Perhaps if we went back 20 or 30 years, then uh, there was only, it was so expensive to collect data that there was really only one uh, game in town, and that was uh, our own organizations. Um, and that's changed. And therefore, the integrated geospatial information framework is not only about uh, creating uh, something for you to use, but also for the wider community to uh, work with as well. The way in which the IGIF is structured is in three parts. Um, the, the documents are all available on the uh, UN uh, Statistics Division website. Um, and in the notes that go with these slides, there are links to those. But the, uh, the three parts are, part one is an overarching strategic framework. And this talks about why the IGIF is important. The second part is an implementation guide. And that talks about what uh, are the things that we need to do in terms of actions to strengthen geospatial information management. And the third one is about what are called country level action plans. I think in, in your sense, these are probably going to be regional plans because the sea doesn't stop at the edge of, uh, of countries. And so therefore your action plans and what, what Hillary was talking about at the beginning, I think is, uh, um, extremely useful and, and extremely um, similar to, to what is being uh, proposed in the, in the IGIF. And that looks at how we're going to uh, progress and strengthen uh, when and who is going to be involved. One of the key parts of the IGIF is what are called strategic pathways. And I think if I look 
back in time and I look at uh, uh, the development of spatial data infrastructures, one of the, the problems has perhaps been that they have focused on the technology piece, uh, the data, uh, the standards particularly. Um, and in some cases, they've been expanded out. But I think that there are a number of uh, these what are called jigsaw puzzle pieces, which perhaps have not been uh, given su sufficient uh, uh, attention. Uh, particularly, I would pick out on that first line under the governance uh, row, uh, finance, uh, and the way in which we are going to be able to, to finance what we what we believe we need to achieve for the uh, for the welfare of uh, uh, of our our nations uh, and the world in general. Uh, and then I think particularly on the on the people one, um, the communications and engagement. And again, I was very pleased to hear uh, that this is a major focus of your own, because my observation would be that in the past we've not been very good at communicating what we do uh, and why it's why it's important. So if we think about uh, the the IGIF, the, the IGIF is uh, a framework. Uh, what the UN working with the World Bank uh, has done has been to create uh, a number of methodologies for actually implementing the IGIF. And what I'm going to be talking about today is the, is the World Bank's methodology. And if we look at this slide and we look at the, the four orange lozenges, um, these are essentially uh, analytical tools which are used within the methodology to actually create uh, on the, uh, uh, the, the middle of the slide here, uh, the action plan that I talked about on the, uh, uh, on the previous slide. So the diagnostic tool starts off and it, this looks at the current state because uh, um, uh, you can't very clearly map your way forward unless you really understand where you are at the moment. The second one is called the alignment. Um, and uh, I was interested to hear Al talking about use cases because one of the key things in the alignment is to make sure that we are looking at actions uh, around strengthening geospatial, which fit in with the, the, the policy drivers uh, in, the, in the nation or in the region uh, that we're concerned with. The third of the, the boxes there is, is what we call the uh, socioeconomic assessment. Um, uh, in these days, particularly of constrained budgets, you don't get very far unless you can lay out what the return on investment is. In other words, uh, if I'm going as a politician to invest in this thing called IGIF um, and spatial data infrastructures, um, what am I going to get back? What's the benefit both to citizens um, and to business uh, as well as to government? Uh, and only once you've been through those stages is it's really possible to put together a coherent and credible uh, action plan. The idea is particularly in the World Bank's um, uh, methodology that these then uh, are used, the action plans are in a form and are backed up by the justification from those other analytical activities uh, to be able to underpin investment projects, whether those are invested in by individual governments uh, or whether they're invested in by uh, donor organizations. Uh, and it was also good to hear Stuart talk about what uh, we would call key performance indicators, which I think are exactly the same as your strategic performance indicators. And this further um, uh, backs up the fact that uh, I think these, these are, are very much consistent ideas. Recently, the World Bank's been involved in um, using uh, the IGIF methodology in a number of different countries. And it's not only been used by the World Bank. Uh, if we look around the top there uh, in, in Europe and, and in Central Asia, Moldova, Ukraine, Georgia and Kyrgyzstan have all been um, uh, exercises in creating action plans, uh, which have been uh, funded by the uh, uh, the Norwegians, so Staten's Kartberg, and uh, then others are, uh, are more World Bank uh, mainstream projects such as Mongolia, uh, Vietnam, where Leslie, who will talk later, has been very heavily involved, and, uh, and Cambodia. 
Um, I've been involved in um, in Seychelles, uh, and that was very much at the at the coastal zone. It was to do with disaster risk management um, and uh, the integration between marine spatial planning data uh, and uh, terrestrial data uh, was one of the key aspects of that. Similarly, in Guyana, uh, in South America, one of the, the major parts of the socioeconomic uh, benefits analysis was concerning the uh, um, uh, ability for cruise ships to come into uh, the waters of Guyana, um, where there was very limited charting. Um, it's now improved somewhat, uh, and that's been part of the uh, uh, the economic case for SDI there. Uh, I could talk about the others, but uh, uh, for brevity, um, I'll just uh, uh, I'll just um, leave those on screen, and you you'll be able to see them in the slides. There's a lot of information around each of those. Uh, some of it's uh, uh, going to be published in the next few months, and some of it's already available. So putting IGIF into the context of of MSDI. Um, what we mean by MSDI will be different in different regions and in different countries and may involve any of those things that are inside that box there, uh, whether they're uh, digital twins, uh, whether they're uh, linked data, which I know Leslie will talk about, or the, the common geodetic data frames that, that, that we have. And, and really the MSDI involves data, systems, uh, software applications, platforms, all of these things are encompassed by the uh, uh, by the term. So from my experience uh, of, uh, of working in uh, um, those various territories we looked at before, um, I think that there are some practical tips on on using the IGIF as you begin to pick it up in the uh, in the hydro world. First of all, uh, the credentials as a, a joint effort between the UN and the World Bank. Uh, I think this adds weight whenever you go into a meeting when you can say that this is an initiative backed by those two organisations. Uh, it gets you a better hearing. You should treat it as, um, uh, as guidance, uh, not as a set of rules. Um, it's got immense practical value as a framework, uh, but it's not a cookbook. Um, there's not one size fits all. Further, we think that it has usage across a wide range of scenarios, whether it's land, marine, or specific parts of the, uh, the, the domain, such as uh, geodesy uh, and geostatistics. Uh, and also it's relevant in private sector organizations, and there are one or two in developed countries that have now picked this up and applied these principles. We should also regard the IGIF uh, guides as being living documents. Um, they'll benefit from enhancement uh, as more implementations uh, are completed. I think also, and the point's been made, that uh, in order for IGIF and SDI to be successful, we have to think about a wider geospatial uh, ecosystem. We need to make sure that we integrate together the ideas from the marine environment, earth observation, geostatistics, as, as, as well as the the, the land environment, and we need to make the approach interdisciplinary. We need more dialogue with a wider range of end users. We need economists to help us craft the case for investment. Um, and we also need to overcome some of these cultural uh, problems that we have uh, around data being seen as knowledge is power, uh, and uh, that's sometimes backed up by security concerns. Uh, and this is uh, this is perhaps one of our biggest obstacles to better data sharing. And also there are non-conventional data sources such as crowdsourcing that we need to take on board. And essentially the IGIF is about improving our location literacy uh, for decision makers, for citizens, uh, but also for ourselves, because I think we spend perhaps too much time uh, talking uh, preaching to the choir rather than getting out there and convincing people in the uh, wider community. The World Bank, uh, as uh, a byproduct of uh, these these recent um, uh, initiatives in various countries, has produced a series of templates uh, which 
cover those four uh, analysis tools that I talked about earlier on. There are also some additional uh, tools that go alongside uh, each of these, and, and, and these are now available uh, on uh, a website uh, which uh, the World Bank has, uh, uh, has made available, and uh, uh, I hope Leslie will talk a little bit more about that uh, when we get to her talk. So I'm not going to talk very much about economic impact because Leslie is going to talk about uh, that further on. But just to say that the implementation costs of uh, implementing SDI and marine SDI, I believe, are coming down. This hype cycle is perhaps one of the uh, uh, the ways in which we we can see this um, uh, and uh, appreciate that uh, this makes it more feasible. There's also quite a lot of information already available around cost benefit analysis, um, particularly in the land community, but also in the marine community as well. Uh, and this is just a, uh, a, um, a link to, uh, to, to one of those uh, meta-analyses of, uh, uh, of what's been done. I think the other thing is uh, that there's another um, uh, inventory which uh, you may find valuable. This is uh, around environmental benefits. There's around about 4,000 studies on this site called the Environmental Valuation Reference Inventory, which is curated by the Canadian government. And I did a query on it earlier this evening, and uh, uh, 467 of those entries, if you enter the marine, um, uh, you get a, a set of references to look at. And there's some, some great studies, which I think when we think about the the, the wider marine environment um, uh, are very relevant uh, to work on things that are globally important, like removing microplastics from the oceans um, and also improving the environmental condition of, uh, uh, of things like the Baltic Sea. And then just one final thing is uh, from one of our studies. Um, this is uh, what economists will expect to see uh, if you're taking a proposal to them for investment. Uh, this is a, uh, a benefit cost ratio uh, analysis, uh, and um, uh, it shows for this particular case in Mond Moldova, sorry, in Mongolia, um, uh, a five-year investment plan, um, and it gives the, the metrics that uh, uh, economists uh, and politicians will expect to back up your strategic case. So just to finish off, uh, if we think about the value proposition for decision makers, um, it covers a number of different areas, um, improved productivity, um, uh, increase in, in data sales, um, which uh, lead to better market insights and, and uh, um, uh, more value being created by what we do. Um, the uh, better decision making, which um, geospatial data can provide, also creating new jobs. Um, the size of the geospatial community uh, worldwide, uh, including users, is is thought to be over 400 billion US dollars. Um, so it's a very important and a growing part of the economy. It can facilitate better risk mitigation and management relating to disasters, and at the same time. It can help us in many ways to underpin the decisions about saving the planet. So my final message, and I guess my, my one takeaway, is um, the case for action is not only strategic, but it's supported by uh, evidence that increasingly we can quantify. So with that, uh, I'll finish off and uh, hand over to uh, um, the uh, next speaker. Uh, thank you, Adam. Thank you, Andy. Very appreciative uh, of your presentation, um, and I know that uh, uh, you're uh, you're up late uh, or, or up very early, whatever it is. Um, it's not a great time for you, so I really appreciate you um, being uh, available and presenting to us. So, um, in the interest of time, um, uh, I, um, I'm going to move on to the next presentation. Um, and so, please, any questions, comments, etc., we'll say for the panel session. But uh, the next session, the the the, the next paper, then, uh, and Andy has 
uh, and provided a great segue into it. It's uh, this is the introduction to uh, iGIF H, um, and uh, we're very pleased that uh, uh, Perlin Peng can um, uh, is here to to to, to um, as he was here yesterday um, to, to make this presentation to us. Um, so please uh, go ahead, uh, Perlin. Thank you, Adam. Just to check, can you hear me and see the slides? Yes, I can. Thank you. OK, thank you. Good morning, afternoon, everyone again. Um, so today's presentation is an introduction to the operational framework for integrated marine geospatial information management, in short, IGIF H. But I don't think we can present a complete picture without first describing a bit about where our working group comes from, um, the UNGGIM, and what it is working on first. So the parent body of the GGIM is the Economic and Social Council of the United Nations, in short, ECOSOC, which in 2011 recognized the need to promote international cooperation in the field of global geospatial information. So they established a committee of experts on global geospatial information management, comprising expert representatives from member states. The UNGGIM is recognized as the top intergovernmental mechanism for making joint decisions and setting directions with regards to the availability, accessibility, and integration of geospatial information within the national, regional, and global policy frameworks. In August 2017, during its seventh session, the Working Group on Marine Geospatial Information was established. And to achieve the GGIM's goals at a thematic level, the group intends to first play a leading role in the policy level by raising political awareness and highlighting the importance of reliable, timely, and fit-for-purpose marine geospatial information to support the administration and management of the marine inland waters and ocean environments. Second, to encourage the use of internationally agreed upon standards, frameworks, schemas to improve the growing interdependent relationships between people and the marine environment. And lastly, to support the committee of experts in the development of norms, guides, principles to increasingly make available the high quality, timely, reliable geospatial information, including any regional capacity development initiatives. So the committee's major focus and foundational management tool that has been, been developing is the IGIF, as we've heard from Andy in the previous presentation as well. I won't go into detail as Andy has put it very succinctly and described it as well. It's in three parts, as we've heard. And Perhaps I would add that the goal of the IGIF is the efficient use of geospatial information by all countries to effectively measure, monitor, and achieve sustainable social, economic, and environmental development, leaving no one behind. So this nine strategic pathways is really the anchor of this framework. And of course, all that we do should help support and progress and monitor the UN Sustainable Development Goals. For our working group, UN SDG 14 is our focus, but I think you will soon realize and quickly see that marine geospatial information impacts much more than just goal 14. Water is at the core of sustainable development and is critical for socioeconomic development, energy, food production, healthy ecosystems, and for human survival itself. Water is also at the heart of adaptation to climate change, serving as a crucial link between society, the global economy, and the environment. We're all connected by the water, essentially. I think we all know all the facts. Approximately 70% of the Earth's surface is water. It is estimated more than 3 billion people depend on the seas and oceans for their primary source of protein. And the International Maritime Organization's also estimated 90% of the world's trade is carried out by seas and oceans. We learned especially in the October webinars on marine geospatial information last year, that everything from coral reef management, management to storm surge and marine debris, we've just scratched the surface of the many important initiatives related to these goals. 
that require good marine geospatial information. So this brings me to the operational framework for integrated marine geospatial information management that our working group has taken this bit of work on to supplement the IGIF. In order to present our part of the IGIF, we are in the process of producing a thematic implementation that will aim to assist geospatial programs with aspects of the water domain. It will do this by presenting a structure for achieving the IGIF goals in the water domain through the IGIF framework. So some questions and topics that will be addressed in this document include what are some of the main challenges that we are facing that we hope to address? We want to bring land and sea together through effective MSDI and SDI integration, address institutional barriers for sharing data and working together to achieve the sustainable development goals. So we need to determine what is the ideal infrastructure for marine geospatial data. And recognizing that the IGH encompasses all parts of the water domain, how do we comprehensively and effectively represent the full spectrum of marine geospatial information, rivers, lakes, tributaries, seas, etc.? So as you might have noticed and heard as well, we've gone back and forth a few times, a couple of names for this document, but we have finally agreed on a name for it. In short, it is IGIF H. And in full, it is the Operational Framework for Integrated Marine Geospatial Information Management. It is a two-part document. Part one serves as an introduction to the document, the main challenges, and part two works to describe the value proposition of the marine water domain, address principles, goals, and the strategic pathways. There are a few key strategic pathways noted here on this slide. It is important to note that the IGIFH mirrors the IGIF strategic pathway groupings and structures. It does not repeat what is already in the IGIF, and it provides specific guidance, examples, and best practices to complement IGIF implementation and ensure representation of the water domain that is, that is included in this integrated approach. And the IGIFH elements are specific to the water domain. So what are our next steps? We have submitted our commitment to the decade of ocean science in the form of an action to complete and implement the IGIFH. We are developing a longer, more detailed version of this presentation that will include specifics regarding the value propositions and more details on part two with specific attention on how we will address the nine st strategic pathways. And as a little preview, I'm happy to share some of the detailed version of this presentation today that we are currently developing, the value proposition and two pathways. So the first question we ask is, what is a value proposition? The description of a value proposition that you will quickly find online states that there are, they are meant to be an easy to understand reason why a customer should buy a product or service from that particular business. And it should appeal to a customer's stronger, strongest decision-making drivers. So of course we're not running a business, but as champions of marine domain, we not only want to help provide sets of best practices for implementation, but also wish to help explain why it is important. We understand that many of us would need to work with decision makers, colleagues from other domains, your boss, high level ministers. Many of these people will not read the operational framework or the IGIF, but want real world explanations of why all this is important. So value propositions are strongly encouraged under the IGIF Strategic Pathway 1 as well, and strongly recommended as a resource for communicating the value of implementing or strengthening marine geospatial programs. The operational framework, IGIF-H, presents several value propositions, but recognizes that this list here that you see on the slide is not comprehensive from a global perspective. We view this actually as an evolving part of the document, and fully realize that additional propositions are likely necessary. And as you can see from this list here as well, the value proposition for the marine domain or water domain 
for building and managing your national geospatial programs, which includes this water domain is extensive. It includes everything from transportation, shipping to basic human needs like clean drinking water. And another piece of this puzzle is governance and institutions. And for the marine domain in particular, most of countries actually have National Geospatial Leadership Board or Council. This board is often responsible for coordinating national interest, policy, and importantly, reporting to ministers in the government on national geospatial activities or initiatives. It, however, may not always start being completely inclusive of all geospatial domains. For instance, it may be managed by a statistics agency, military or land mapping branch of the government. It is critical at an early stage, we feel, to make sure that the marine domain is represented on the leadership board. And this can be a primary tool to ensure that the importance of marine geospatial information is communicated to the national leadership and that interagency coordination has as few hurdles as possible. And in terms of institutional arrangements, part of the work that should be done concerning interagency collaboration and others is to establish these governance structures and arrangements. These are formal and sometimes informal cooperation structures that support and links public and private institutions which are used to establish the legal, organizational, and productive frameworks that allow for sustainable management of geospatial information. Another piece of this puzzle is legal and policy. One product that we are most familiar with is the nautical charts, and its purpose is to support safe navigation in SOLAS. For the most part, the world views nautical charts and its related products as living legal documents that need the backing of national policy and legal instruments. It is critical to consider the concept of collect once, use many times, with regards to law, law and policy as well. A comprehensive policy and legal implementation with full consideration of the water domain should ensure data is not produced for a single purpose only. And given that considerable amount of data is produced for safety of navigation based use cases, this reuse must be adopted at the fundamental level of policy and legal structures. We think that an IGIF implementation needs assessment should identify the need for strong influence in IGIF terminology to assure the reuse of data in the water domain for these various use cases. And to this end, there is also a need for strong influence when defining policy and legal structures to ensure data is made available for scientific research and education. So scientific research often requires data from entire regions and across boundaries. So policy and legal structures should promote this interoperability and standardization to ensure that data is fit for reuse by the scientific community as well. And it is therefore recommended that any policy and legal framework should define a sustainable business model for its institutions as well as guidance for how and to what extent data in the national infrastructures can be licensed, shared and reused. So there are many other pathways that we hope to discuss, consult and further develop financial data communication engagement standards. And we will use this completed deck as our running presentation for a series of global consultations that should begin sometime in March to August this year. And we hope to take advantage of both the UNGGI and regional committees, as well as IHO regional hydrographic commissions, including the Southwest Pacific Hydrographic Commission, in order to reach out to as many as possible. So we invite you to join us as well for this global consultation process. And thank you again for this chance to introduce the IGFH to everyone. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Perlin. Um, uh, yes. Uh, very keen that the Commission is uh, involved and stays engaged with you, and I know that will happen through our Marine Spatial 
the data infrastructure working group. Um, and and so we, we as I say, uh, um, we will, I think, take an action to um, ensure that we stay engaged with you. Um, uh, and potentially there might be an opportunity for some intercessional, an intercessional um, uh, activity. Um, so we will stay, we will stay uh, engaged. Um, I'd like now to move on to our next presentation um, uh, and uh, invite Leslie um, to um, make the next presentation on open data, achieving the value proposition. Um, and uh, Leslie, please, please go ahead. Just to note that uh, we're running a little bit behind, but uh, um, I want to give this session, um, uh, do this session full justice. Um, so we may well uh, go over in terms of the the end of this agenda item, uh, but I but I am keen that uh, we uh, we give it the the um, the time. Okay, Leslie, uh, over to you. Thank you. Just unmuted there. Uh, I assume you can uh, see my slides. Is that correct? Yes, we can. Thank you, Leslie. Thank you. Um, well, firstly, Perlin, I was so excited to listen to your presentation. I've lived and breathed this IGIF for uh, three years now, and to see it being adopted and adopted at a theme uh, base is really, uh, really, really exciting. So um, uh, be pleased to uh, uh, contribute and work with you. If there's anything, uh, please reach out. But today, I will talk about the IGIF. I'm going to do full circle and probably touch on uh, what Hillary was talking about, uh, the action plan. Hillary, I didn't uh, meet, see your presentation. Uh, Andy referred to it, talked about it being actions. I'm afraid it was 5 a.m. in the morning here and I, and I didn't see it. But um, I hope that I don't overlap too much. So let's talk about it first in that um, let's get this definition right. So there's a number of definitions around open data. Um, before we even start talking about its value. And um, it's really that the common definition is that it is free. Uh, it's able to be used by anyone, reuse, repurpose, redistributed, and really you only need to show an attribution uh, for copyright and you have to share it in the same way as you received it. So that's from the definition that I will be talking about today. The framework is one aspect, it's a guide to actually building your strategy and most strategies have a common goal to improve access to data, making data accessible uh, to everyone. Uh, and part of that, part of or only one part of access is to actually consider that data open. There's many other aspects such as the technology and making uh, the data that is accessible of good quality. But open data is one objective in working towards a goal of uh, access to data. And of course, that's underpinned by um, this usual open by default unless there is a valid reason not to do so. And by that, I mean that there's a legal privilege, commercial incompetence, um, uh, uh, privacy information and so forth. Uh, so there are some, some rules to, around uh, providing data openly. So when you think about the strategy and look at the elevation and depth strategy 2030 was actually developed by ICSM and there's five uh, key uh, strategies uh, that were developed there. So again, the same messages, access to high performance data, unified discovery. So by that, we've got all our states and territories all collecting um, hydrographic data. This is making sure it's all interconnected and can be viewed in a seamless way. Uh, the integration of it um, uh, is important, not just with other other uh, bathymetry and ocean data, but also with the topographic, particularly on the coastline. We know we have integration issues in that littoral zone. Being able to query it, we talk about knowledge on demand now. So being able to easily query it, and particularly by machines. Uh, Andy mentioned linked data. I wasn't going to talk about linked data. It is a passion, um, but uh, linked data is a way that easily connects between these data sets. But we typically have a, a little bit more to do before we even get to exploring linked data and uh, uh, these queries. 
And the last one, of course, is around collaboration. And I think those five key points, um, while they'll be worded differently uh, in a number of strategies, they come up all the time, particularly when we have groups, and in your case, in a region, working together, uh, and you're working together uh, towards achieving a common vision. And in this case, it's looking for a marine infrastructure. So um, I'm going to refer to a document that was produced, uh, was released uh, in uh, 2020, and, uh, but the data in it is for 2018-19, and it's the one done by Deloitte. Uh, you've probably read it, uh, but it will actually serve a purpose for me for this uh, communicating uh, what I want to do today. So again, uh, strategic actions, and these are all familiar, modernising the management online access, publicly available. All these key uh, themes keep coming up all the time. So Deloitte, Deloitte put this uh, together for the Australian government, particularly uh, Geoscience Australia, and uh, it was trying to look at that key messaging about what that value of that data is. And the actions that are actually come out of it are what needs to happen in order to achieve that value. So that's the connection there. Um, increasing the rate of data acquisition, uh, filling the gaps, it's all about the coverage, uh, providing the seabed uh, mapping data uh, is essential to a number of different areas, and unlocking the archives. I thought that was really interesting. So there's so much data being collected over a number of years, it's really valuable in order to understand climate change, sea level rise, and so many other things that are impacting on our uh, environment. Now, uh, the three areas when we think about the value of open data, and of course there's the social value of it. Uh, we're talking here about community safety, uh, the well-being of people, their resilience to national hazards such as storms, and of course cultural significance as well. And from here, I'm referring to um, uh, shipwrecks, finding them, that historical significance, and some of those submerged islands that were once used by ancestors of our first peoples. In the economic area, uh, productivity improvement, I'm going to talk a lot more about that. Cost reductions, uh, growth in the blue economy, again, I'll talk a bit more about that. Uh, your data, I say your data, hydrographic data, does uh, promote so much revenue generation, job creation, and of course, um, those territorial limits that you help to define are all about uh, the economic zones. The other uh, third one there is the environment and of course the data you're using is there to preserve, regenerate the marine environment, to manage it, to monitor it, to do research on it and again particularly that coastal management which is really where the blue economy is focused and of course um, there are future um, uh, initiatives around renewable energy, of putting wind farms out in the water now. So there's uh, so much more uh, happening in the water than, um, than uh, before. So uh, when you move from strategy and why we talk about the value proposition, and Perlin mentioned this, it's the story that's really important. And I'm not an expert in the hydrographic area, so in some ways it's a litmus test does the story make sense? Now, when we worked on the Elevation and Depth 2030 uh, strategy, um, we had lots of discussions through workshops. And there's one story I, I always remember, and, and it's the story where they're saying to me, Leslie, it's um, if we really can measure accurately the bathymetry uh, in our ports, we can put much more oil in, uh, sorry, oil, oil uh, or ore into our ships. And, um, you know, we can do that more and more without them actually touching the bottom, but we, we can measure that closely. And the more, of course, the more uh, value it is to the economy because the more we're shipping overseas. There's a case study. I looked up the case study and uh, 300 million in value add just by being able to properly measure the sea floor in our ports. That's an exciting story. That's an elevator story. And that's a story that ministers and senior leaders can understand. It's one I understand. It makes so much sense. So that story is really important. 
Now in the uh, Deloitte, uh, they also have a story. The other aspect is the numbers. The numbers are a good story. And so in uh, the, the uh, document, it talks about data production and how much uh, uh, economic activity is generated directly because of production, but also the uh, industries that it supports, so the more uh, indirect um, uh, value there. It also talks about the number of people employed and it refers to it in terms of F, uh, FTEs. So here we say it's 56,000. Now that's not 56,000 hydrographic surveyors. I guess you're probably thinking you wish it was because where are you? This is, there's not enough hydrographic surveyors out there. Uh, so much work to be done. But it's all those people that have something to do with geospatial. Uh, and that I found was uh, quite fascinating. Again, this is the story. This is the story. It is bigger than the transport sector, the economic um, uh, value and, uh, and potential is bigger than the transport sector, the rental and the hiring services. That's interesting. What's even more interesting I found is that 75% of our water in our region is still to be mapped. So if you can, it's mind boggling what the potential is in terms of value in, in uh, dollars. So I'm going to talk, so I've talked about the story and that's really important. Uh, now I don't have a story for each of these use cases. We tend to put a lot in use cases in our strategies and that's all really interesting and I'm going to talk about them now. It still is not the story. So under each use case, uh, if we look at the research use case, there is a story about how the environment has been protected. And they're, they're the ones that you need to actually tell. So, um, so ha let's have a look. So from the Deloitte's, I'm sorry I've referred to this document. It's a recent one, it's a very good one. Uh, in the research area, 120 million value add um, uh, for 2018-19 period. 250 million value add uh, in being uh, uh, for search and rescue, saving lives. And in the defense area, deep sea exploration, the, the naval activities, 5.5 billion is added to the economy by these activities that are stimulated by the use of hydrographic and, and the bathymetry data, uh, and there's more. Oil exploration, 740 million value add, that's just the exploration. Aquaculture, 840 million establishing those farms and the locations and the economy that it is um, growing in those areas, 850 million, uh, 840 million. Uh, commercial fishing, 1.5 billion, and it's actually double that for international, uh, uh, international, uh, oh, sorry, no, so 105 billion uh, in the area of commercial fishing. And if you imagine um, all the improvements uh, around uh, less petrol used and, and so forth because of the improved data and navigation. Uh, domestic tourism, 1.7 billion, and it's double for international tourism when you start adding all the cr cruise ships in. In the transport sector, 3.3 billion, and that's really uh, both freight and uh, passenger vehicles. And uh, then, of course, the big one, the big one, access. Uh, to uh, uh, providing access to data for oil and gas extraction. So they are really exciting and there's how those values start to come up. So the values tell a story, uh, particularly if you're a minister in one of these areas, um, they'll understand these stories. But again, um, uh, there are other stories to tell, particularly around the social uh, aspects of using the data and the social value. Okay, so um, geospatial data underpins everything. Uh, look, uh, almost, <laughs> okay, almost. Um, and uh, again, drawing out from the Deloitte study, you can see here they took uh, 16 sectors and um, the geospatial, as you can see there in the first column, underpins 15 of those sectors. So what that is saying is that geos it's showing that geospatial data uh, 
is, is used, and this is the hydrographic data, the bathymetry data is being used across all those sectors. I can only assume that the one that it missed out on was personal finance, which is the third last one there. Although if you have a boating accident, it's going to affect your personal uh, finances. And I would suggest you spatial uh, could have played a part in preventing that. But uh, have a look at the document. Uh, it's really interesting to see how it does underpin these um, activities. And that's supported by uh, an EU document. I've used this one previously in, in uh, presentations done in 2017. Again, geographic information is right up there with environmental information and the transport uh, information as well. So, and this is looking at it from a commercial uh, use perspective. Uh, so it has high value in the commercial sector. Okay, so accessibility is a recurring problem. Uh, back in 2014, I was working with uh, the, the ICSM, that's the Intergovernmental Committee on Surveying and Mapping, and we did a baseline of the Australian Foundation Spatial Data Framework themes. And it's interesting there to have a look at the depth theme. The depth theme in terms of accessibility is actually one of the, the lowest, which means that the data has been collected, it's been well collected. In fact, um, I mean, this survey looked at loads of uh, elements um, and standards of one of them and depth data was, was very well uh, produced um, in terms of data standards, but the data wasn't accessible. Um, there was very few, and again, I'm talking about 2014, very few um, uh, uh, portals uh, to access that data. That's actually due for its 10 year baseline um, update to see how it's progressed. And so that's one to, to monitor. But I wanted to point that out because the other data sets are tracking at the same rate and improving, uh, but depth um, uh, will be tracking at a similar rate. I'll be interested in the discussion to see uh, what you think about that. OK, so um, another thing that I pointed out, I mean, this had loads of questions, but I just a couple of things that I thought were interesting. And this is around the duplication. Um, it's been mentioned before uh, we want to use this. I think Perlin, you mentioned it. We want to use this data, collect it once and use it multiple times. And yet um, some of the responses were that there is duplication. Um, Pretty hard to tell. In some cases, a lot of people didn't quite know uh, whether the data they were producing was collected elsewhere. In some cases, yes, and that there were three to ten other agencies. Oh, just to clarify, this survey was done uh, for government agencies. So duplication was occurring and mainly around the reasons uh, there's a lack of awareness that the data existed, there's some technical barriers, it's not interoperable, they couldn't use each other's data, so they collected their own, and um, it wasn't particularly suitable for um, each other's business. And, and that was quite typical across a lot of the themes, um, um, and the symmetry or depth data uh, was one of them. OK, so I do a lot of workshops on open data and I just wanted to share with you the um, commonality between some of the barriers that come up and some are perceived barriers, some are real barriers. And um, if I can just say the questions they, they, they tell me, the importance of our data as a public asset, uh, asset is not understood. The shortcomings in our data, look, they don't want it to reflect badly on the reputation. They know where the quality is poor. Our data might be misused. If put in the hands of the non-experts, how will they use it? And there's concerns in those areas. Concerns around privacy. Um, people can re-identify, de-identify data. They can re-engineer it just by linking information. There's quite a lot of concern uh, there. We don't actually know how to release that data comes up because there's no processes to explain how you can effectively, uh, securely and um, with minimum risk uh, to disclosing uh, sensitive data. That there are processes, but they don't tend to exist in all the different um, areas. The other one is there are some policies that are confusing for people. You know, they've got, we must protect our data, don't you know, privacy act, uh, but then they've got this Freedom of Information Act to, com to comply with, and it gets really confusing. They never quite know which act um, they're working under. 
Sometimes they just don't have time to get the data ready for release. It's very time consuming um, and they don't feel it's ready for um, to be used. Um, sometimes it's not necessarily in the right formats. Uh, we're using proprietary formats. There's some concern about security risks. Um, and I think, Andy, you think you mentioned it. Cybersecurity uh, is an issue for uh, people think that if they can get through to the portal to get data, they'll get through to that next step and look, uh, be able to see behind into the internal, uh, internal IT systems. Uh, how does the free data, if we suddenly move to a making our data freely available, how does that actually uh, affect our existing markets? Because we know there's markets there, particularly in electronic charting and that. How's that going to impact that market? Uh, finance, of course, selling our data is often redirected back into maintain, maintaining data. So how are we going to maintain the data? And the last one there is, you know, if we release data, are we going to be sued if we're releasing um, data inappropriately, such as sensitive data? Or is it the quality? There's an error in it. Will we be sued if someone has an accident? And the other one that comes up at the time but people don't understand is, um, I'll, I'll use an example. So working with the roads department, they have a data set that shows hotspots. They know all the particularly traffic light areas that are there's a number of accidents. They actually didn't want to uh, release that data because as soon as they've released it, people know that they're hotspots. And if they have an accident, they were worried that then uh, they'll be liable because people would say, well, you knew that was a dangerous area. Why didn't you fix it? So this is a, sometimes a concern. But of course, you're going to have to balance it up with what the advantages are about opening up access to data. And in terms of the roads, knowing where those hotspots are, if you're sending your children off to school on a bicycle, you want to help them and plan them uh, their journey to make sure they're actually uh, going in uh, uh, on a route that is avoiding those hotspots. So there's quite a balancing act here when you start to think about how you will release data and what the benefits are versus what the risks are. Okay, so how do we overcome the barriers? And um, okay, and it is one one way is with open data policy. I just want to say though that open data policy just encourages a position of openness, and it's actually not going to overcome all the barriers. There's actually a collective pieces of work that you will need to consider to be able to achieve that open data uh, value proposition, which is people are using that data. Um, and of course, uh, so, so let's have a look at some of them. And, um, and it's around governance. So I'm going to continue on where um, Perlin left off and going and looking at some of those actions that you will need to consider that will accompany open data policy. And one is the need for champions. Champions in each of the countries uh, in this region are going to be so important for driving change and the importance of that information as a public asset. There are the guidelines, but they're supporting the guidelines that support the policy. Uh, they may be policies in themselves. And um, how do you deal with privacy? third party intellectual property, the copyright, the licensing. Do you price it? I mean, it is still possible to price this data and make it open. Um, what are the access categories that you'll stipulate and the data security? And there's more, <laughs> there's more. I don't want to frighten you here, by the way. <laughs> Um, in terms of education, it's about those release processes, how to classify information. Are you going to have a common classification uh, across the region? Of course, the data is really important. With most open data policies, you actually have an open data plan. Um, that open data plan is supported by an improvement uh, roadmap as well. Uh, uh, so you can improve the data as you release it and have the confidence to release it that not impact on your reputa reputation. Some agreed quality controls around timeliness and frequency and coverage, uh, quality statements. So the users know how to use that data. And of course, formats as well and moving into a new environment which is about linked data and making it not just human findable on your portals but findable by a computer so in a format that a computer can read 
Um, Al talked about uh, new models, S100, the seamless models across the region uh, is for usability. How does that information connect? And yes, the need for standards, collaboration in acquisition. Um, and this is regions working together. If you've got a vessel out there doing some mapping, um, you know, reuse it for an adjacent area. <laughs> it's all it's all about uh, these partnerships and their other partnerships. Um, of course, in terms of innovation, there's the portal system itself, or it could be a system of systems. We're talking about regions interconnecting. It's not about putting the data in one system. It's about bringing all the different systems together so it's viewable and findable in the one area. And of course, it's findable because data, uh, your metadata needs to be machine readable too. Um, and then, of course, the communication. Uh, but then you mentioned this as well. What's available? How can it be used? Um, what's coming up in the future? And are all those messaging around its value is really important. And then the funding. So organisations may need to look at their funding models, uh, given uh, they're moving to a free and open data model. And uh, a market impact assessment is always reassuring for leaders to understand how that market will be impacted by a government change in policy and position. And so you can see there what we've done is worked up some actions for your uh, action plan <laughs> quite quickly uh, just by thinking of one element and that is opening up access to data and achieving the value proposition. So it's uh, it's it's a multifaceted uh, action uh, or problem uh, requiring a number of actions. Uh, and that's where I'm going to leave it. I know, uh, I hope I haven't gone over time. Uh, I did add quickly in a slide, so you can send this slides out to everyone uh, with the World Bank templates. I didn't have a chance to put all the words in, but the links down here to those documents that uh, Andy mentioned, are they're, they're great templates. Uh, the smaller ones are supporting templates. Um, so for example, the baseline assessment, there's also an Excel uh, document that is the diagnostic uh, with the questions to help you do the assessments. So I hope that you find that they are valuable documents uh, as a region, but also for each of the individual countries working towards your IGIF action plans. So thank you very much. So uh, Leslie, thank you very much uh, for your presentation. Uh, that's uh, very much appreciated. Um, and so we've now um, at the three presentations, we are running a little bit behind time, but uh, um, I will give the panel session uh, at, at uh, its its uh, its time slot of, of, of 20 minutes. So please bear with me. Um, and um, from the presentations, uh, I certainly feel uh, I'm convinced um, and, uh, of IGIF and the uh, and the open data value proposition. So um, I'm going to hand over now to the chair of this session, uh, Stuart Minchin, uh, who uh, is the uh, Director General of the Pacific Community. Um, and, and Stuart, just uh, for your information, because you're slightly delayed joining us, uh, I did actually um, share those questions um, with the um, uh, uh, conference. Um, and so um, I'll put those I'll put those on the screen. So um, those are the questions that I've shared with you. Uh, Stuart um, and, and the panel. Um, yeah. Thanks, Stuart. Can you hear me OK? Excellent. Yes, Thank you. All right. Well, I'll, I'll also note, uh, I, and I don't know if you introduced this at the beginning, Stuart, but we've got uh, Kim Pickard joining us as well on the panel. Uh, Kim um, is coming from Geoscience Australia. She's also the uh, Oz Seabed uh, Steering Committee Chair and the Deputy Chair of Australia's National Marine Science Committee. So welcome, Kim, and uh, thanks for joining us. Um, so uh, um, just to give you a little bit of, um, uh, you know, we'll, we'll try and keep this, uh, this session to time, um, so we won't uh, we won't delay too much longer. Uh, to give you a little bit of background, though, uh, I. Um, uh, I'm the Director General of SPC, which is uh, the 
Pacific Community, which is the largest uh, development organisation in the Pacific um, and really is the home of the science and technology expertise in the uh, Pacific. And we, uh, we're owned by 27 member countries in the region. So um, uh, it's, it's our team uh, in our geoscience division that does a lot of the um, uh, the maritime boundary work, the, um, uh, the uh, marine survey as well, and we have a big role in the region in data sharing. So it's a great um, uh, opportunity uh, to to have a chat with the panel about about these uh, questions. So, um, all right, um, I'm I'm going to uh, fit all the questions just a little bit and give a little bit of more um, uh, context. So we heard a little bit from Andy that um, the data is power and this sometimes causes um, uh, challenges uh, with, for data sharing. In our region, in the Pacific, um, where you've got small governments uh, with limited um, uh, geospatial capacity and capability uh, often in only a few people uh, with, within those governments. Um, and that uh, can cause, you know, when you've not got 56,000 people that are that are looking after um, at this data, the challenge is that it, um, uh, that, that data is power issue becomes quite um, distinct and, it, and people tie the data that they're looking after to their employment, if you like. As well as that, in our region, we deal with the issues of uh, data sovereignty being a big um, uh, issue and cultural appropriation uh, being a concern. Um, so, what I'd like to hear from each of the panelists: what do you what do you say to people in the region who are worried about sharing their data? How do we actually um, move this forward to, to make them comfortable with the idea of sharing? Um, let's start with uh, Kim for you. I was just worried. It's nice to cross path again, Stuart. <laughs> nice for stuff to Um I think it's well, it's true. It's about having that conversation and taking the time. I think, you know, there's no doubt it's interesting. We're all on the panel here, um, definitely pro adoption um, here, but you're right in, in raising that point and and understanding what prevents and having that discussion of the pros and cons. Leslie um, showed really well the perception or the ideas um, as people would know you know I'm more from a scientific background so I'd like to lay my decision on science and and I think there is um, it's listening to each other and taking the time um, I said from the no seabed perspective you know even though we're well surrounded I would like to say that 50,000 people 56,000 people is not geospatial people taking care of that information by the way <laughs> it's people who benefit from that that information um, so I think it's important that um, it's been difficult like even for us who are well surrounded geoscience Australia the hydrographic office you know it's not an easy question and we're all struggling and, and listening to each other and taking the time and, and having a champion to go through the pieces one by one is is probably what what's going to help the most like from my perspective is sitting there and we we are all rushing a lot you know we all live in that world of <laughs> one thing after the other um, but if that is so important then then I think we need to have those conversation and probably not online like this but probably go and sit and and yeah it is a journey um, but we need to come together and really lay on on the table the why and all of it. I think we are scared sometimes of different position and discussing and and that needs to happen to break through, I think. Thanks, Rick. Great, thanks, Kim. Uh, Leslie, your perspective. Mm, yeah, thank you. So firstly, on the power one, I think because um, we've gone through all this, um, I feel like I've been in this industry too long and seen it happen. The key thing for me is to the more customers that you have, the more people using your data, the more you are integrated and embedded within their services, no one can turn your agency off. So you're there forever. And I think if people understood them more, they collaborate. There's because it's always these fears that someone will take over their role. But in actual fact, it's the other way around. 
And it's also that um, the appreciation of their knowledge and expertise that you cannot be expertise in all these areas. Have you seen from my presentation? Yeah, no, you can. And, and so um, I think that's the key message there for me around that one. Um, capacity, um, look, as an industry, we, we, we need to start working uh, more on workforce development. I think this is uh, uh, an issue across all the sectors, land surveying as well. Uh, um, and uh, uh, I do like how the UN uh, and the World Bank supports capacity development. Surveying, hydrographic surveying is a hard one. You, you, you need to have um, your surveying degree plus more qualifications. And uh, because it's such a complex thing and the, the safety around the, the services delivery as well. Um, so yes, I think that this is a question for um, the region, uh, the UN and the associations and the governments all working together for our workforce development uh, plan. Uh, funny enough, with my triple S high hat on, that is one of the key reasons why we are joining forces um, uh, around this issue across, across the sector, workforce development. Uh, sovereignty is an, int an interesting uh, one as well. I, I don't know if you meant it in terms of um, crossing over the, the, the territorial borders <laughs> or you meant about the data, because I'll take it from the perspective about data, storing data in the cloud, offsiting it. Yeah, look, that's a concern for, for all. And sometimes um, uh, I th it's where the data is stored not where the data is accessed from. So if we can leave the data with the agencies who know how to manage it, are the experts, they know how to tell us the quality, leave it there and just provide that and facilitate the, the viewing and, and uh, of it, uh, I think is one way around that. Anyway, I'm going to stop there and hand over. Back. Thank, Thank you. Leslie. <laughs> Andy, your perspective. So, um, uh, I think, Stuart, if we, if we look uh, to India. I think India is a classic example where there were huge problems to do with or perceived problems to do with security. Um, and to the extent that uh, uh, there was uh, a campaign to remove uh, Google Maps from being available within India. Um, what I think the realisation was that the cat's out of the bag um, and that actually um, there, there are organisations out there um, which are working on a global basis where you can see where your nuclear power plants are. It's not a, it's not a secret. And so therefore, uh, making it open actually has the advantage that uh, decisions can be made more sensibly uh, on a multilateral basis um, than if the, if the data is locked away. But you have to respect where the security forces and others are, are, are coming from. So I think it's, it's, it's overcoming that by dialogue uh, and by example. Great. Um, so I'd, I'd like to pick up on a, a theme that, um, that came out there around uh, you know, the, the workforce development and the capacity development um, needs. One, one of the differences we face in, in our region, in the Pacific, um, is uh, as is is the issue that uh, we have small populations with small governments and therefore small numbers of capacity, um, the ability to 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 build capacity in, in, uh, or the ability to to actually um, to develop capacity. Because if you've only got four hundred people in your public service, for example, you can't become uh, you know uh, world class hydrographic surveyors as well as fisheries managers as well as nurses and doc, uh, doctors and police and judges and everything else. So what we end up seeing in our region is that there will be one or two people in the government who are responsible for the hydrographic part of, um, uh, you know, the, the, um, the, the country. I'm interested in your take as because the IGIF and the World Bank project um, has, uh, has lots of good um, uh, material in there, but like many UN uh, um, um, focused programs, it's it's built on a an idea of helping the individual country develop this expertise. In the Pacific, 
it's not the country that will develop the expertise. The expertise will develop in organisations like SPC or SPREP or uh, the regional institutions that are put in place because you can't physically um, build that uh, a sustainable capacity in the individual countries uh, or duplicate that, you know, 22 times in, in, in each island nation. Um, so I'm interested how, uh, just be interested in your take, how do we need to adjust um, the IGIF approach um, for this region where it's not necessarily uh, going to, you know, you, you, if you can imagine and put, put in your head, you might have one or two people who are responsible for this implementation, not a, not a department, not a, uh, not a team of, you know, 50 or, or 100, um, one or two people. How do, how do we actually make that uh, occur in our region and, and get the outcomes that we're looking for here? Um, so maybe I'll, 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 I'm, I'm going to point to you, Andy, to start with. Okay, no, that's, that's, that's fine, Stuart. Uh, I mean, I think this is, this is um, you can see this in microcosm when you, when you look at bigger countries um, and local authorities. And those local authorities increasingly are working together where they have this concept of shared services. So you may have expertise, for instance, in database management sitting in one country. You may have expertise in designing the dissemination of data in another. And so I think this, this is one way in which you can, you can leverage um, the expertise across the region. And that's why this group is, is, is so powerful. I think though the other thing is that the um, uh, developed countries who have got the 56,000 people, you know, we'll, I'm sorry, that, <laughs> that number uh, is yeah. obviously, that, that, they're, they're, there's probably 3,000, you know, there might, there might be 5,000, but there is enough expertise there to uh, form bilateral relationships. And we've seen in Europe some really good bilateral, strong relationships over 10, 15, 20 years developed, for instance, between the Norwegians uh, and some of the countries that uh, I've been dealing with, where uh, there is uh, a donor aspect to it, but it's got in mind sustainability. So weaning the countries eventually off of uh, the, uh, the, the donor model, so that the business model actually becomes uh, sustainable by, as we all know, there's a lot of things you can now do with technology. And so, therefore, we need to leverage as much of that as possible. But this bilateral relationship between organisation between countries um, and uh, um, uh, in the region who are less developed and more developed countries, I think, is another model. That kind of collaboration is one that uh, I know you're pushing, Stuart, and uh, uh, I think it has to be fed into our domain. Thanks, Andy. Do you want to uh, take a, a stab? Leslie? Uh, yes, look, um, I, I, it's really interesting. So I've been doing work with the UN and working in Fiji and Tonga. Hello to everyone from there. And over the past two years, we've met once a week online to talk about developing geospatial action plans using the IGIF. Um, what the countries have done is not put on board one person, which is how we started. It was one person from each team. We started developing up uh, some of the earlier uh, assessments. But gradually there was a realisation that uh, it wasn't that one person. This needed to be a team approach. And each one is now uh, got a group. They're all tackling their own pathway, uh, building up that expertise, but importantly, building up that strategic expertise as well. So for me, that's been a fantastic journey on that. What I'm hearing, though, is it's part of the Southwest Commission to get involved as well because that will start to bring some connections. So that, so we're reducing duplication across government and, and getting them to establish their governance frameworks within countries, but also across the region is really important. And so um, this needs to be some engagement, I think, in the Southwest Commission um, and uh, through these sort of training processes. Countries can put their hands up um, and contact, of course, Greg, Greg and Tio uh, will, um, are always looking for people who are really going to be committed. There's some time commitment in that training, uh, but it's really actually proved really beneficial um, as well. Um, anyway, yeah, 
but I think that the Southwest Commission needs to get involved in that process because they're the only ones that will see those connections. Thanks, Leslie. Um, comments, Kim? Uh, yes, too. I don't have much to add to this because I'd written both things that each of um, Andy and Leslie added, the partnership. I mean, you have to leverage from each other and the other one is ownership. So each own a bit of the pie and together own the pie, you know. And again, you know, I don't live in your seat, uh, Stuart, and understand every single political aspect that may be there. But I think, you know, we're in a world where we need to do this. There's not enough hands to do everything. So, um, and, and I think that definitely applies and, and I'm sure people are, we need to do it because it's truly beneficial. Um, and so you need to be convinced at the start that it'll benefit you and then you're happy to trust, you know, certain groups. So, thanks. Great. So we're ne nearing the end of time. So I'm going to end with one question uh, and just get a very quick response from each of you. Um, so many or much of the data collection in our region is actually uh, undertaken uh, by, of course, as well as the, the uh, military and, um, and uh, you know, uh, official hydrographic units um, by private institutions and philanthropic trusts that come through uh, in, with their own vessels, for example. Um, the challenge we see, though, is that the data all goes back to the east coast of the US and um, uh, and gets published in good scientific literature, uh, but never seems to make its way back to the region. Right? How do we how do we fix this? How do we ensure that uh, everyone who collects data in our region on the seabed, uh, you know, can contribute it to a common uh, a, a common platform or a common uh, a picture of what's going on. So I'll start with Kim this time, because I know this is uh, close I, to your heart, Kim. Yeah, that's right. Um, I think it's a bit of both sides, really. Um, I mean, you, it is my understanding you definitely from your own EZ, you know, each country will have to give permission to collect information, and that should be a requirement to receive back at least or ask to be connected um, to that data. So so I think having a reciprocal arrangement to do this, but really when you talk about the philanthropist and, and all the others, yeah, I agree. It's, it is our duty to, to go and then talk and make the impact inside um, the, the areas that it's most needed. And and we need to carve that time and we need to car, um, carve it well. It, I, I just can't can agree more with having to put this effort in there. It's not good enough to to hear this. Um, and so so I'd recommend, uh, um, yeah, on both sides to have that and the JEPCO and the bigger international groups needs to, the Southwest Pacific Commission, the JEPCO groups need to take the time to go in and, and particularly reinforce. Um, and of course, we can share the data if there's no infrastructure, but there's infrastructure outside. So how to make it easier for people to use? So um, it's both responsibility, really, and and we need to do more. Thanks, um, Leslie. Anything you want to add? Yeah. Look, scaling up project acquisitions. Um, I remember presenting a few years ago. World Bank really important in terms of SDIs. The governance around it is coordinated acquisition plans. Uh, and programs so we're not collecting the same data. Uh, and, but the standards come important. I can remember my staff, uh, this is topographic data, um, you know, they'd be given data by another agency uh, to use, Commonwealth Agency. <laughs> and and uh, I'd say, uh, we've got this data, they're sharing it. Why isn't it in ours? Well, it's, it's in a box <laughs> under the desk. Why? Because it's so hard to integrate. This, it was just too hard, the, the, the manual piece of work to actually integrate, particularly um, uh, dams and things, you had to cut polygon lines and, uh, you know, it's too hard. And so I imagine that happens, but uh, as well. So it's, again, this multifaceted issue to solve the one problem. Mm, anyway, I'll, <laughs> I'll hand back. And Andy, a quick response? Um, yeah, no, name and shame. Um, because uh, I'm afraid that there are a lot of organisations, NGOs who ought to know better, who actually never hand back the data. So, um, uh, you know, we've got to we've got to get out there and 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 say you can't do this, uh, and make and particularly then don't let them in again if they if they won't share the data. 
Part of it is that part of the process is they don't identify a custodian for the data before they as part of the project. Uh, you collect it, but as long as you give it back to someone to maintain, you know, and it doesn't get lost and outdated and loses value as well. Thanks. There's, there's power in, so I'll finish now that the, the panel, thank you very much to the panel for, for the discussion. I just mentioned that there's power in uh, identifying priority areas for collection as well um, for, for uh, um, if you like, uh, uh, um, opportunistic collection when, when people are in the region. Uh, Kim will remember a great example in Geoscience Australia that we did with the MH370 search of just asking the ships to take a different track every time they went to the search zone. And we collected 800,000 square kilometres of new seabed data just from the, the path of those ships as they went in and out to the search zone, to the actual search zone for MH370. Um, you know, new, so opportunistic data collection, uh, ensuring that all of the navies in the region understand where we want data collected, uh, all of the philanthropic trusts understand where we want data collected, um, you know, can help in, in, uh, in ensuring that people aren't duplicating or um, or running over the same seabed. But uh, thank you very much for the panel. It was great discussion. I'm going to hand back to Stuart now for um, uh, the rest of your uh, conference. Thank you. Well, thank you very much, uh, Stuart, for chairing the session. And thank you to the presenters um, and for the panel members. Thank you, Kim. Um, um, I, I, I find this fascinating, uh, this, this, this subject, because um, time and time again, uh, I've experienced uh, um, issues with data, data sharing, um, duplication, um, knowing that data has been collected um, and it not being made uh, available, um, and also um, the issues um, that uh, were articulated in, in, in terms of Pacific Island countries with a small population and, and small governments, and less ability to build that uh, uh, capacity as well. Um, so um, I, I would uh, I, I would like to suggest we continue this discussion um, as the Southwest Pacific Hydrographic Commission, um, and we would do that with uh, other regional um, uh, organisations, um, and obviously that includes uh, SPC, um, and and potentially then work. Um, with with some of the donors as well. You mentioned the World Bank there. Um, how how to how can the IHO um, influence the World Bank in terms of some of the contracts and some of the um, funding it releases um, to ensure that it is then the data is is made available and and, and shared. Um, so uh, if 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 um, I think for, from from this discussion, what I would like to see is. Uh, Further collaboration and 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 further uh, within the region um, and Southwest Pacific then um, taking an action to um, to continue this discussion um, to uh, uh, allow us to um, come up with some some actions um, and also some uh, uh, collaboration um, to achieve uh, to, for, for, for two things. One is which is the um, the I give. Um, and uh, I think that we're very uh, interested to um, be involved in the IGF H and how that might um, uh, uh, might be implemented within the region. Um, and and so I think I said we will stay connected in um, with with with, the, with, the, with 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 that. But in terms of uh, open data, um, I think we would take an action to continue this conversation. Um, and look at how we might engage further, but also examine the issues more and then and then potentially come up with some actions. Um, so it's relevant then to us in hydrography um, and and, and um, delivers to our region. So I'm happy to take any other comments or any other feedback. Uh, Adam, if, uh, if, if I may, I, I think that the, the opportunities around spreading the awareness. It's been great to have this discussion today, but there's there's more to be done. And uh, I think the po potential collaboration with the uh, uh, with with the World Bank, whereas I can't speak for them, uh, I think that you might be pushing at an open door to uh, 
uh, enhance that uh, collaboration, particularly around the IGIF uh, and its wider use. Thank you, Andy. Um, we'll, we, we, we'll, we will pursue that um, and, and uh, we'll take that back to IHO as well um, or other um, for consideration. Um, yeah, so any other any other comments or feedback? OK, so um, I don't see any. Um, so we'll draw this agenda item to a close. Again, I would really like to thank the um, presenters 